morning, everybody. If we could stand up together and worship and praise our God. He's done great things for us this week. In times maybe where we've just forgotten to acknowledge him, we can come now to him. Repent of the things that we need to repent of before coming into his presence, understanding that he is miraculous, amazing, beautiful, gracious. He is a merciful God who cares for us. Um, he has called us out of the grave because of Jesus Christ. His blood has covered us and redeemed our story. So let's, let's worship and praise together. celebration and freedom and gratitude and thanksgiving together 
Praise God for the cross. Praise God for Jesus Christ, the true and living God who was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit came for us, that his blood would be shed on the cross. That was our cross to bear, and he came. And so in Titus 3, we understand this. It says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It says the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And so it's a glorious day because of who Jesus Christ is, the plan that God had for us. A love like no other, a mercy and grace given to us like no other mercy and no other grace could ever be given. Let's sing together.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh.
awesome. Got some energy back there. All right. Um, just a little housekeeping thing. If we're having some technical issues with the screens up here, uh, we've been investigating that for a while now, trying to figure out what it is. I apologize for the flickering. I hope that's not too distracting, but we're aware of it. We're trying to figure out what that is. So uh, anyway, just know that we know. <laughs> All right. Uh, over the past several weeks, we've been on a series called Locked In. Um, that Locked In title comes from when you know we're talking about sports teams and people say you got to get locked in, you got to be like have a laser focus, okay? And that's what God has called our church to. We are in the series. Our series is going through um, the first three chapters of Revelation, and this is. Uh, the last church, last of the seven churches that Jesus speaks to. And in this, he's talking about a church that lost its way. And while one of the things we have to remember, each time, each letter to these churches, it's writ written to a church that existed in a specific period of time at a specific place and had specific issues. So when you're reading this letter, it was written to these people for certain reasons. Now, as we look at it, we can find principles in there that are timeless, that transcend location, that transcend culture, that, that transcend all time, that are applicable to us, right? So as we get into this, um, this last one, uh, we're going to see some things about a church that, that, as I said a moment ago, lost its way. Now, Next week, we're going to be talking about what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do through this church. Um, God has put us in a specific place during a specific time in history and is bringing people all around us. The, and as, as a pastor, one of my responsibilities is to understand what God's doing around us. Amen? And so that we can be his light in the community that he's placed us in for every church depending on where you at the same we have the same mission but it looks a little bit different and we're going to talk about how that has unfolded here and the different ministry opportunities that God has given us and how God has uniquely gifted this con this congregation to meet these needs it, it, it's not about us drawing a crowd in this room it's about the impact we make outside of this room. Amen? All right. So we're going to look at a church that forgot about that. All right? Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, I, we do obviously have the um, scriptures up here, but I, I always encourage you to open your Bibles, underline things, write notes to yourself. Um, you'll see uh, the bulletin. It has an outline in there as well, but... Uh, uh, you can follow along with me. Beginning in verse 14, it says, And to the angel of the church at Laodicea, and that word, this was originally written in the Greek language, and the word there that's translated angel actually can be translated messenger, or that one who conveys the message in this particular sense. It's speaking to the pastor of the church, the messenger of Jesus. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, he starts off immediately. Notice that he says, the way he describes, the way Jesus describes himself here, is he says, the faithful and true witness. He's not a faithful witness. He is the faithful and true witness. And he's writing to a church that has been unfaithful. He's writing to a church that has not been true. And you see, while that can be stinging, in and of itself, here's the great comfort that we can find in that passage. When we're not faithful, he still is. When we are untrue to what we know to be true, he's still true. He is the constant in our life. Okay? Find comfort in that. Jesus is the faithful and true witness. Now, to the church at Laodicea, all of these churches are in Asia. Um, the church at Colossae, the church at Hierapolis, and the church at Laodicea are just several miles apart. 
They were all founded while Paul was in the city of Ephesus. Uh, the, in fact, there's a person that Paul mentioned several times. In, his name's Epaphras. Uh, scholars believe that Epaphras was the one that founded or started the church at Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. Um, they were all situated along a major uh, trade route. Laodicea, what differentiated Laodicea, it was a very wealthy city. A lot of people retired there. A lot of the investors, a lot of the entrepreneurs, they retired in this area. So as a result, it was known for its banking industry. There were many at that time, what we would call millionaires or billionaires today, resided in the city of Laodicea. It was very well known for three things, and Jesus will play on this. He, he will talk about this and compare it to their spiritual condition. The city was very well known for um, its school of medicine, and in that school of medicine, there was an eye salve, a, a Phrygian eye salve that was known to treat uh, vision conditions, uh, and it was well known all over the known world for that. They were also known for this black wool um, it was very soft, it, it, was, it was jet black, and they were known for that. They were also known for something that wasn't a positive. They had a lack of a fresh water supply. Now, here's what's interesting. The city of Colossae was known for its cold springs. The, the, there was these streams and rivers that carried ice cold water. I mean, it had, but Colossae, or, uh, um, Laodicea didn't have that. Then, on the other part, Hierapolis had these hot springs that people would go to and get in those hot springs, you know, for medicinal things and all of that. Well, Laodicea was right in the middle. Well, what would happen is when they would send water through the aqueducts, the cold water, the ice-cold water at Colossae would lose that. It would become lukewarm by the time it got to Laodicea. The hot spring water would become lukewarm by the time it got to Laodicea. So, the waters that had their original purposes in those two cities lost their purpose by the time they got to Laodicea. Jesus refers to that and applies it to their spiritual condition. Um, so let's, let's go on. Verse 15. He says, I know your works. Speaking to these, I know your works. Now, that's all he says. There's no commendation there. In fact, they're really... He doesn't elaborate on that because there wasn't anything worth talking about. In, in, note that in this city there was no persecution. He doesn't call them out for some blatant sin. He doesn't identify false teaching. He just says, you know what? There's really nothing you're doing that's making a difference. In fact, you have left all those around you unaffected by your presence. I think one of the worst things that could be said of a church is that you were there and you made no difference in anyone's life. And I think one of the worst things you can say of an individual Christian is you were in your family and you didn't make a difference. You were in your workplace, you didn't make a difference. You were in your school, you didn't make a difference. You just didn't care. And that's what he gets at. I know your works. And then he goes on. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Okay, I don't know about you, but that's pretty straightforward. Uh, somebody says, you make me want to vomit. I mean, I don't perceive that as anything positive. All right. Um, what he's saying is you're neither hot nor cold. They've lost their zeal. They've lost their passion for Christ. Ch church is just something they do. Yeah, let's dust our Bible. Where, where did I put my Bible last Sunday when I got home? Oh, yeah, I left it on the shelf. No, it's in the back seat of the car. That's kind of what was going on here. There was no passion for Jesus. There was no ongoing desire to grow in their walk with Christ or to make him known. They become spiritually apathetic and complacent. They were unmotivated and self-centered. In fact, they're the type of people who believe, you know what, now, it's good that you have faith, but, but don't be fanatical. You can go overboard. You'll find that that's a foreign concept in Scripture. 
when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, what did he say? To love the Lord with how much? All my heart, all my soul, all my mind. That is passion. That is zeal. He didn't just say, just a little bit, whatever you have left over. If you have time, love me. If you have time, serve me. No, he said, look, you want to know what the most important thing in your relationship with the Lord is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Passionate and consumed with that thing. So, Jesus says, because you are lukewarm, because you are so uncommitted, you're self-centered, and really, you're communicating to everybody around you that you could care less about them. It makes me want to throw up. It makes me want to spit you out of my mouth. Now, as I said a moment ago, that's harsh. I mean, when somebody says that to you, is that offensive? Y'all, come on now. I, we're going to have to start having church at 2. Maybe everybody will be, will be awake. All right. But it's, it's incredibly offensive. Jesus cuts to the quick and, and just says, hits them right here. Now, you're a refined person. You might say, how dare you talk to me like that? We live in a culture that likes to be offended, that looks for reasons to be offended. May I say, we have to be careful in what we choose to be offended about because the Lord speaks truth to us. He doesn't tell us what we want to hear. He tells us what we need to hear. And sometimes that is correcting wrong behavior. Sometimes that is dealing with something that we have allowed into our lives that shouldn't be there. And it's like anything else. When you have to remove a, a tumor, when you have to remove something, it requires surgery and it is painful. So this is what he is getting at. Now he goes on, verse 18. He says, because you are lukewarm, because you're neither hot nor cold, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. In other words, gold that has all the impurities burned out, that has went through the kiln, that the goldsmith has taken and put in the furnace, burned all the impurities out, so it is pure gold. Gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now, as he does that, as he says these things, he's talking to people who he said, you say that I'm rich. In other words, these, these folks thought that they were in one place, but they weren't. If you ask them, hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, man, we're doing great. He says, no, you're not. You're not, you're not doing great at all. They had a false estimation of themselves. They lacked spiritual awareness. So he says, I count you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and then the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Basically, he was saying, stop expecting your spirit, spiritual needs to be met by the marketplace. See, one of the things that he's speaking to here is they were in a very wealthy city. They were very prosperous. They really had no material needs there, most of these people. Is that something that we can relate to here in the United States? I mean, if you've traveled much at all and gone outside the United States, you're well aware that we have it better than the majority of people that live in the world that we're in today. Okay? Now, that... That doesn't mean you're to be ashamed because you're in the United States. We were born here. We didn't choose to be born here. And there's nothing wrong with having things as long as those things don't have you. The, the problem here is the things had them. Okay? And because of that, they became just very smug and, and self-focused, self-centered. He says, so be rich towards God. He says, buy from me gold refined by fire. He's like, be rich towards him. Understand, you being right with me, you being right in your relationship with God is more important than any amount of money that you could accumulate. Being justified by Christ. So that gold refined by fire, notice, 
the first thing he does is compare their their uh, financial wealth to their spiritual poverty. Then secondly, he says he urged them to buy white garments contrasted with the black wool that's known in their area, that they, that they were known to be a, a part of the prosperity of that region. He says, buy from me white garments. Now, white symbolized uh, being justified through faith. It symbolized righteousness. Buy these white garments so that you could be clothed and not naked. Now, at that point in time, especially in the, these cultures during this time, the, the worst thing that could happen, and they did this sometimes in judgment to people who had, they stripped off their clothes, and that was the most humiliating thing that could happen. And he, that's why he said, you're spiritually naked. You, you should, you, there's shame there. Um, but clothe yourselves with white garments. Whether well, clothe yourself with my righteousness. The righteousness that only comes through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Cover your shame. So he, he talks about the money. He talks about the black wool. And then he says, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. He said, you know what? You may have a great school of medicine. You may have some eye salve that people come from all over the known world uh, to use to treat their vision. But you know what? This is not going to help your spiritual blindness. You need some spiritual salve to go on your eyes. And you know, Jesus does this with every church. Something that was peculiar to their area, he used it to describe what they were lacking spiritually. And you know, as I was as I was going through this and reading this and everything, I, I thought, you know, I wonder what he would say to us here. I wonder what parallels he would point out from the material to the spiritual. Um, verse 19, he says, he goes from calling them out. He goes from, from talking about all these things that they should do, what he counsels them to do. Verse 19 says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Those whom I love. Okay, what's he saying? To these people who are unfaithful, untrue, disobedient, uncaring, he just said, I love you. I love you. So that's why a lot of people, they look at this letter to the Laodiceans, and I've heard sermons on that where pastors just blister people and you feel like you've been beat up with the Bible. Um, this is a letter that reminds us of God's faithfulness even when we're not faithful. Now, that doesn't mean it's any less stinging. Um, do we all have a tendency to wonder a little bit? I, I have. And you see, if you say, well, no, I've never wondered, you're wondering right now. I mean, there, there's, see, the thing is, it requires spiritual humility. I don't care what your position is. I don't care how many years of, uh, of service in the church. I don't care how many uh, seminary degrees somebody might have. I don't care if they're a pastor, a bishop, or the pope. If you don't have spiritual humility, you can be as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. And Caleb, if you ever need to know how lost a goose in a snowstorm can get, I'll tell you. All right. But so he loves. He, that's one of the things. You've been unfaithful, you've been untrue, you've become callous towards me, you don't care about the people around you, I love you. He says, for those whom I love, I reprove. I, in other words, I reprimand, I scold, I admonish. Now, my parents love me, they love me enough to encourage me, they would always come and support me and stuff, but they also scolded me. Now, that's always fun, isn't it, when your parents would scold you? Or uh, as my dad would do is light my rear end up. I don't know if y'all have parents like that that would, uh, you know, as, as an old-timer said one time, his dad could take his belt off so fast he thought his hips would start. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so he reproves. Those I love, I reprove, I discipline, I punish or correct. There, there is, Jesus does the same thing to us. He loves you. He's going to reprove you, scold you. He is going to correct behavior. And there can be punishment in that. 
And please understand this. Every time something bad happens in your life, it doesn't mean the devil did it. Sometimes bad things happen to me because I made a stupid decision. Uh, there was an old saying one time, if I could kick the person that was responsible for the majority of problems in my life, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. Um, and then God also punishes us. Sometimes God allows things to come into our life that we need so that we'll be straightened out spiritually. Um, so he reproves. Those he loves, he reproves. He disciplines. And then he says, so be zealous and repent. Be red hot for me. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be the person that kind of, you know, if I don't show up to church, nobody knows. If I, if I do, still nobody knows. I just kind of, I'm there. That's what lukewarm is. And see, when a church is lukewarm, that means a church cannot exist in its community and there will not be a difference. I want to ask you this question. Now, this, this is... Here's one of those hard questions, okay? And I say this out of love. If you weren't here for a month, would anything stop? Okay? See, here, here's part of the thing. God has given us this church as a whole. He's given us a responsibility. He has given us the responsibility to be a light to this community. That has been in the school system here. It has been in, in partnering with the medical uh, community. It has been so many different things, okay? But we can't do that with a portion of our congregation. Amen? So see, this is one of those, this is one of those hard truths that we've got to ask ourselves. Man, if I didn't show up to church for a month, would anybody, any ministry stop? I know that's hard, but please hear me saying that out of love. So he says, be zealous and repent. Be so passionate about Jesus that you want to get everything out of your life that shouldn't be there. Not only do you want to stop doing things, but you want to start. And see, the thing with a habit, if you just stop a bunch of stuff, that's not good. You have to have something to fill the void that's left. All right? So what he's saying, be zealous and repent. Turn from the bad habits, turn from those things, and turn to me. Be zealous, be fired up, be passionate, be red hot for Jesus, and come after me. Repent. Do that you turn. Now, that's true in salvation, but it's also true in sanctification. As a believer, sometimes we've got to repent from bad behavior. Sometimes, can't we all get a punk attitude? We can. And sometimes it takes somebody that loves us enough to say, you know what, you've got a punk attitude. Um, so, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So, because of that, be zealous and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, th this is a beautiful verse right here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who took the initiative to seek who out here? Jesus went to our door. He went to your door. He went to my door. Behold, I stand there, indicating he's been there. I knock. In the way the, the, the grammar there is it's a continuous, repeated action. I go on knocking. The pursuit doesn't stop. Okay, not only have you been unfaithful, have you been untrue, and have you forgotten about me, but you're not even responding when I'm knocking. Almost has the thing of, I know none of y'all do this when there's a knock at the door, the doorbell rings, and you go look out a window to see who it is. I don't know y'all do that. Um... It almost has that feel to it. But Jesus is standing there knocking. Now, I know this verse is really used out of context a lot. It's used in an evangelistic uh, context of saying, Jesus is standing at the door and knocking at your heart uh, of you, unbeliever. 
no, that's not what this verse, this verse is not written to those who haven't trusted Christ. This verse is written to Christians. This verse is for believers who have wandered. And Jesus is standing there knocking at the door. Saying, will you answer? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open it, and that's circle, if you got your Bible open, circle that word if. Because it's a conditional statement. If. If you open the door, I will come in and you will dine with me and I'll dine with you. What, is that, what does that mean? I mean? Fellowship is getting ready to be a little bit deeper. One of the things that I was trained to do early on through some people, the guy that led me to the Lord, is have people in your home. Open up the doors of your home and invite people in. Because what happens is when you go and you have dinner with people, when you go and you, you get to know them at a level that you're not going to know by meeting at restaurants. When you open up your home, that is hospitality. That is something that we're inviting you in to the most intimate place we have. We're inviting you into our home. Okay? Jesus said, you invite me in and we're going to get to know each other in an even deeper level. And you see, now, while that positive part of that is true, the reverse is, is also true, or the inverse is also true. If you don't open the door, and you don't invite him in, and you're not fellowshipping with Jesus, you're going to lack intimacy with Jesus. Okay? So, if anyone, if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, yeah, I wonder... For you, Christian, this morning, if you've gone through a period in your life where you feel like you, you don't, you're not hearing from the Lord, if you feel like your relationship with Jesus has become this stale thing that, that you would describe it, well, I don't feel anything anymore. Um, maybe it's because you hadn't, you hadn't answered the door lately. He goes on, verse 21. He says, The one who conquers, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. The image there is somebody who has overcome. Somebody who has overcome sin. Somebody who has overcome this um, lukewarmness spiritually. It's the vision of people who have victory okay in fact romans chapter 8 write that down on your book you go back and read through romans chapter 8 uh, at a later time um, but when it says you can come you, the one who conquers i will grant to him to sit with me on my throne okay you hear me talk a lot about when we come to christ it's the u-turn okay we turn from self-centeredness and the pursuit of self and sin we turn from that we repent and we turn to jesus okay this path that we're on now to Jesus is called what the Bible refers to as sanctification. It's becoming Christ-like. All right? Here's what this path means. We're learning how to conquer. We're learning how to have victory over sin. We're learning how to have victory over the things that keep us from Jesus. We're learning how to be faithful in truth. Okay? But it's a constant battle. It's constant spiritual warfare until we get to heaven. And then one day, as that verse says, we will sit down with him. That's symbolic. Whenever it talks about sitting down, it means it's over, it's finished. That means the victory has finally been won. Okay? So when Jesus was resurrected, it said he went and did what? Sat down with the Father on his right hand. Right meaning power and might. Sitting down meaning it's finished, it's over, it's done. There's not some battle going on in heaven right now where it's a back and forth. That's over. The victory's been won. Okay? So what he's talking about here is, in my name, battle. You're more than conquerors, as it says in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, let me translate that. If God's for us, it doesn't matter who's against you. Right? 
So he ends it like he ends every letter to every church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you've heard me explain that many times over the past few weeks. You heard it, but did you hear it? It's heartbreaking when we can sit through message after message after message that deals with something and leave every week unchanged. Don't leave unchanged. Here. Here. Now, let's look uh, to the church at Laodicea. There's several things that he does in every, four things he talks about in every church. The characteristic of Christ. Christ is faithful in truth. Witnessing of what God desires in our lives. The commendation to the church at Laodicea, there was none. They had become apathetic. The condemnation of behavior was being lukewarm, apathetic, and complacent. You know, I'll do it if I have time. I'll do it if there's nothing better to do. Corrective action, open the door. Open the door. All right, lessons from Laodicea. Quick. These are in your bulletin. First, they had come to a false estimation of themselves on the basis of their material possessions. They had come to a false estimation of themselves on the basis of their material possessions. You know, right now, if you go to Iran, if you go to China, if you go to uh, Muslim countries, there is persecution going on like crazy. But I want to tell you something. The church is thriving. The underground church is thriving. There are more believers in China than there are in the United States. They do so behind the scenes. Okay? There are people coming to Christ in the masses but we don't see it because it's not allowed. Okay? The one thing more dangerous than persecution is prosperity. Because prosperity gives us a false sense of security. See, if you have nothing, you have to pray to God for everything, right? But if you have everything you need, you have a tendency to do what? Not pray. I'm, I'm good. I got it all. In fact, if I've got more, what was the, the story that the guy had the barns, his barn filled up? He said, man, I'm just going to build another bigger barn so I can store even more. Wasn't thinking about being a conduit for his blessing. But prosperity tends to give us a false sense of where we are spiritually. Have we become smug and self-satisfied and not really thinking about the spiritual dynamic of this. I mean, here's the thing, even in this country, if you don't have a job and you're homeless, there are places that you can go to get food and help. That's not true all over the world. Okay? So, I'm just saying, they had a false estimation of themselves on the basis of their material possessions. John Stott said this, he says, Perhaps none of the seven letters is more appropriate to the church at the beginning of the 21st century than this. It describes vividly the respectable, nominal, rather sentimental, skin-deep religiosity which is so widespread among us today. It's kind of like getting vaccinated. You get just enough of whatever it is so that you don't get the whole thing. Some people have gotten that in their faith. You just get enough so you don't get the full-blown thing. Je Jesus said, be consumed by it. Um, when it said, Jesus says to them, for you say I am rich, that false estimation. You know, there is a condition that psychologists have identified. It's called affluenza. Y'all ever heard of that? Affluenza? It's an array of psychological maladies such as isolation, boredom, passivity, and a lack of motivation engendered in adults, teenagers, and children by the possession of great wealth. In other words, we've entertained ourselves to death. 
I mean, some of you, probably much older than me, remember when there was nothing to do around here. No. Come on. Get a laugh? Okay, all right. But now, I mean, my goodness, there are things to do all over the place, aren't there? I mean, just if you want to drive 20 minutes, there's just about anything you want to do. Okay? That wasn't always true here. We, we have gotten to the point to where, man, we can buy whatever we want. We buy these gaming stations. I remember when I was a kid, when you went out to eat anywhere, it was a big deal. You went to Long John Silver's. You, you know, for us, I mean, that was a big deal. I mean, much less you go to the steakhouse. That was a big deal. Well, now, I mean, we eat out all the time. Or going places. It used to be a big deal. You went to the beach. My goodness. Man, did you hear so-and-so? Their, their family got to go to the beach. Well, we go to the beach three or four times a year now. I mean, do you all remember what I'm talking about? See, the prosperity, it begins to numb you to these things. And, and all of a sudden, you don't ever say, okay, well, that's enough prosperity. You just, you just want more and more and more. And, and there's no such thing as enough. So this affluence, you, and you tend to get bored. I mean, the kid's sitting around, well, there's nothing to do. My, you, you got a $800 gaming console right there. You've got this, you got that, and you know, God forbid that you read. Um, <laughs> that wasn't in the text, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, <clears throat> but their problem was not their wealth. Okay, please hear me saying this. Some of the most godly people that I know have been very blessed financially. But the one common thing that they have is they're all conduits of that blessing. See, here, here's the problem that you get into. Is every dollar, every dollar that you increase is not meant for you to raise your standard of living. God wants you to share in the kingdom work as well. And that doesn't mean just necessarily um, the, the church is wanting more and more and more. We're all meant to be conduits of his blessing. Okay? But if every time we get a raise, we're thinking about not what we need, but what we want. Have we ever gotten to the point where, you know what, I, I really have enough. Do I really need anything else? You know, I mean... You know, and you see on social media now, you see people that have the, you know, the, the Lamborghinis and, and all of this stuff. I mean, it's easy for us to cast judgment on them. Oh, how many more Lamborghinis do you need? But can we say something similar to us? What do we really need? See, sometimes we quit being conduits of God's grace and it starts stopping up on us. Well, we'll just get, you know, the good car that I have, man, I could get a nicer one. Well, that one's not nice, and I'm going to get a nicer one. Well, this house, I'm going to get a bigger one. And the question is, do we need it? And that's what he's getting at here. We become so self-satisfied. And the first question, when God adds more to us, we say, all right, what else am I going to do for myself? The, there's not a thought of, how can I be a blessing? Does that make sense? It's not about the money that you have. It's making sure that the money that you have doesn't have you. Okay, is everybody with me there? All right, I want to make sure with that. Secondly, they lack spiritual awareness of self and others. They lack spiritual awareness of self and others. They had no idea that Jesus saw them as spiritually destitute. None. They thought they were good. And as I look at that, I, you know, you, you pray and you say, God help me that I don't become blind to my own sin or blind to that kind of spiritual apathy. And then the other, you're blind to self and others. Oh yeah, we're good. We're good. And all around you there's need. And not only do you not see it, you're not looking for it, you're not even willing to do anything about it. Guys, there is need all around us. Okay? This area of North Hall has changed drastically. The number of impoverished families that are here, the number of people that are here from other places. Now, and that's a whole other discussion. I know that there are a lot of views on that. 
but what our responsibility is as a church is to minister to the people that are here. Amen? If there's need, I, we, we're called to meet that need, right? Um, there's all kinds of things going around us, going on around us. See, the question is never, is God working? God's always at work. He's always at work in our community, at your place of employment, at your school, in your family. God is always at work. The question is, am I at a point in my life spiritually that I can recognize what God's doing? Just this week, I, I, in fact, there's a... You call somebody in the church, hey, hey, God's gifted you in this area. I know somebody that needs help. Could you use your giftedness to help this person? That's what the body of Christ is for. Several of you have businesses, and whenever I call, I say, hey, there's a person in need. Could you help them? Always happens. That's, that's what we're for, right? That's what the body of Christ is about. Helping people spiritually, helping people materially, helping people work through things. So they lack spiritual awareness of self and others. Next, they were influenced by the secular culture around them. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but we have to make sure that the church doesn't look like the culture. Okay? And I know that especially in the political environment that we're in right now, uh, there are a lot of churches that have heavily mixed um, a lot of political stuff. And I had somebody say, well, if the church isn't involved in politics, they're not preaching what they're supposed to be preaching. I don't preach politics up here. What I preach is the word of God with principles that should guide you in making the choices you need to make. Amen? Okay, while I love this country... And I am so thankful to have been born here. My job is not to make you an American patriot. Are we good? Okay. That's, you, you're not going to see the confetti cannons. You're not going to see big flags dropping behind me. My, my job has been called to preach what? The gospel. The word of God. That's right. There are other people that I think devote enough time to patriotism that we can all get that from there, right? Okay? But I have a very specific responsibility. And my job is not to mix or convolute the two. I preach the gospel here. All right? We're not going to be influenced by the culture. We should be the influencers. Next, true faith in Christ. Now, this is very wordy, but I did it on purpose. All right? True faith in Christ is zealous, fervent, passionate, fanatical, obsessive, and extreme. Extreme for Christ while demonstrating humility towards Christ. You're all these things for Christ while demonstrating humility toward Christ. Now, for all of you people that like to fill in blanks, I just gave you an overwhelming... Oh. You're going to leave fulfilled today. But I was trying to decide what one word was I going to put in there. And I know some of them are synonyms, but man, I was just looking at that. I was like, zealous, fervent, passionate, fanatical. Are you a fan for Jesus? Obsessive and extreme. I mean, I if you look on social media pages and everything, people are excited about a lot of different stuff, and they will be extreme about a lot of different things, whether it's hunting, fishing, taking selfies. Oh, man, if you shared the gospel half as many times as you take selfies, there'd be three million salvations in this area. But being all of those things while demonstrating a humility towards Christ. Um, William, uh, or uh, this quote that I read the other day, it says, if he, talking about Jesus, says, it is perhaps most offensive of all for people to affirm the glories of Christ, but then live, to, li live their lives as though they meant little. Is Jesus 
really the Son of God? Did he really die on a cross for our sins? And then do we just live our lives that don't reflect what we say we believe? The quote says, If he is the Son of God who became a human being, died for our sins, and was raised from death, if Christmas Day, Good Friday, and Easter Day are more than meaningless anniversaries, then nothing less than our wholehearted commitment to Christ will do. God's called us to be more than just those creasters. You all know what a creaster is? Christmas and Easter. That's when you show up. That's not Christianity. Right? Romans 12.1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Notice it says living sacrifice. There are some churches that I've been in that they sing a lot of songs about going to heaven. They sing a lot of songs about heaven. And that, that's a great promise and it's a great reality. Amen? But we're called to be a living sacrifice. In other words, our lives are to be offered up to him. Worship is not just what we come and do in here for uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Worship is the way we live our lives, that we're giving, we offer up our lives to Jesus. Now, the question is, is what, what does this look like for you? What does this look like for me? How, how do you offer up your life as a living sacrifice to Jesus? Write that in your bulletin right now. How is my life a living sacrifice to Jesus? What does that look like? Because it looks like different things for different people. What God's called me to do is not going to be the same thing he's called you to do. Okay? What does that look like? What does it mean for you to be passionate and sold out for Jesus? There are some of you uh, who are in the school system. What that's going to look like for you is going to be something different. Because I know a lot of people that, that leverage that to be an influence for Jesus. They're salt and light in the community. Coaches, right? business owners. It, it may be something that looks completely different for you. Okay? Um, that's the thing, being sold out for him. Jesus wants each one of us in our own context to be red hot for him, to be passionate for him. And then the last one, Jesus' love for his followers is unconditional Tough, proactive, and persistent. I'm very wordy today. But one word just doesn't capture it. He stands at the door. And knocks. His love is unconditional. As you saw, even while the Laodiceans were being unfaithful and untrue, Jesus says, to those that I love. It's tough because he's saying, for those I love, I reprove and I discipline. I get in your grill is what he's saying. Okay? But it's unconditional. Even while they're living like that, he's knocking on the door. He pursues them. He goes to their house just like he pursues us when we are unfaithful. James Boyce said this. He says, Christ is knocking at the closed hearts of those who are his, but ha who have turned their backs on him and shut him out of their complacent, self-satisfied, worldly Christian lives. The knocking Christ is an image, not Jesus calling unbelievers to give their hearts to him, but of calling drifting worldly believers to sincere repentance and renewal. I'm going to stop there. I'm, there's a, another quote, but I'm not going to read that. What's Jesus calling you to today? Every one of us, and I, I'm saying every one of us because I'm including myself in this, we have a tendency to wonder, okay? You know, I, I can speak for myself. Pastors have a unique 
um, uh, set of circumstances in that the tendency for some pastors to wonder is that Bible study, my, my time with the Lord becomes sermon preparation. And it becomes a dry business type thing. I have to be on my guard against that, that I'm just not studying the Bible for another message, that I'm just not studying the Bible for another Bible study. It, it can become very dry. And when you're always counseling and helping people and doing stuff, sometimes if, if you don't have more coming into the tank, you can get burned out. Okay? That, that, this stuff that pastors deal with. What do you deal with? We all have different sets of issues that are, are, are difficult for us. But the thing here is, while it differs for each one of us, we all serve the same Jesus. Amen? The same Jesus who is faithful. The same Jesus who is true. The same Jesus that loves you unconditionally. The same Jesus that will pursue you when you've wandered. So, here's the invitation today, and I know Go ahead and ask uh, our band to come up. I know coming to an altar sometimes and praying, there's some kind of a stigma. And in different churches, it, 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 it's, it, it, people handle it differently. Some bunches of people come to the altar almost every week. Other churches, kind of like this one, you see a few every once in a while. And I was talking to somebody one time, and they said, well, it was kind of like when you go down to the altar, you feel like everybody's talking about, I wonder what they did this week. The altar is simply a place that's symbolic where you come to the Lord. It's not that you've done anything, it's that you want to be faithful. Today, I'm asking you to set this, uh, just set those stigmas aside. Don't worry about who is out here. Don't worry about what someone might think. If you hear Jesus knocking, if you know that you have wandered, you come. You come to the altar this morning. If you need to talk to a pastor, we'll be here. No, nobody's going to you know, pull you aside or anything like that. If you're here this morning and you're like, God, protect me, keep me from wandering. Because here's the reality. Every one of us can live in Laodicea. There's not a person here who that is not a temptation. Okay? So when, when our, our band starts playing in a few minutes, I'm getting ready to ask everybody to stand. If you feel that you come to the altar this morning, okay? Sometimes this is a good thing. Because we need to know, we need to be ready to do business with Jesus so that we don't find ourselves on the other side of a door with Jesus knocking, trying to get in. Amen? I want to ask you if you would stand. You respond as God lays it on your heart this morning.
just saw right there. I'm telling you, that's what the church looks like. Amen. To believe that Jesus is good and that he is faithful. We are here to pray for each other and keep each other accountable, pursuing Christ together. We got to have more of that. <laughs> that's why we're here. I'll leave you a couple things this morning. 
Uh, we're collecting items for the Good Samaritan Food Bank. So um, if those are in your bulletin. You can bring those on a Sunday or Wednesday through the week. Church office is open uh, Monday through Thursday. They're on, uh, there's bins on different levels that you can leave those. If you are a parent of a 6th grader through 12th grader, I have two things for you. Um, United Weekend signups end on Wednesday. Sign up for that. We also have a meeting right here in the Sanctuary Worship Center, right here about summer camp. So if you're on the edge and you don't really know, I just invite you, if you're a parent, just to come here about what we have for summer camp. Just to hear what's going on, what God's doing in our student ministry. It's going to be right here, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and if, you, if you're in the room today and you're like, I'm not a parent and I want to partner with it, there's so many ways with scholarships and serving and giving your time that you can serve the church in different ways in our student ministry. So as we go out today, let's go out on mission as we love God. Love people, make disciples, have a great Sunday.